Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Episode 60, Mayan Medicine, with Rosita Arvigo. Rosita is an herbalist, ethnobotanist, doctor of nepropathy, author and teacher living in Belize. In this episode, we speak with her about growing up in Chicago, where her grandmothers each showed her different wild plants to gather. We speak about her moving to Mexico in the 70s, and then to Belize, where she met Don Eligio, who is a traditional Mayan shaman and herbalist. She studied with him for almost 17 years, until his death at age 103. We speak about spiritual bathing, the essence of spiritual healing, some of her favorite plant and herbal allies, and her technique of abdominal massage, which has transformed the lives of many people. I would like to announce that we are starting to upload some stuff onto YouTube, So far, our podcasts are going to stay audio only, but we are uploading some informational videos. Uh, We just uploaded one on Ella Campaign about how to harvest and grow it, and we're going to release another one about how to make medicine from it. So if you want to see that kind of stuff, you can go to Plant Cunning on YouTube and subscribe. And also, if you want to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash plant cunning and sign up now we will get to the episode we had a wonderful time with her it was a great pleasure and i think that you'll enjoy this episode as well okay so today on the plant cunning podcast we have rosita arvigo how are you today wonderful thank you here in sunny belize in december (laughs) yeah we're in uh snowy new york (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) So we are really excited to talk with you today. Um, you have all these books and all of your technique and everything that you've done in your life is just so amazing to us. Um, but we like to start out by asking how you got onto the plant path. Uh, I think like uh, most herbalists who spend their life with plants and, and uh, healing herbs, it uh, really started in early childhood I was a a child of immigrants. My mother was from Iran. My father was from Italy. And so both of those cultures, uh, when they came to America, were very steeped in natural home remedies. Uh, As a child, my grandmother from Italy always took me on a streetcar bus to the end of the city line in Chicago where we could harvest dandelion greens and some other uh, wild herbs that she used in cooking. But dandelion greens was the primary focus of those forays and she would bring them home and uh, saute them with olive oil and actually serve it on um, uh, baked pizza pieces with cheese. So her favorite dish was uh, like a pizza pie with cheese and dandelion greens. Sounds so delicious. that was memorable. And then my grandmother from Iran always gathered grape leaves. Mm-hmm. Grape uh, vines grow wild abundantly in the Midwest. And Chicago was a, an amazing resource for the Native Americans of that land for wild grapes to make their pemmican. So the uh, grape leaves were everywhere. And as a child growing up uh, on the north side of Chicago, and uh, my grandmother from Iran also had a favorite place at the end of the streetcar line and a basket to collect uh, grape leaves for her dolma. She mm-hmm. used to um, put them in, uh, in brine and then take them out and then uh, wrap up uh, lamb and rice and, and uh, Persian spices and So that was an important uh, part of of my beginning. And my mother said that I was always interested in plants at the age of four. She said I would be out in the backyard 
where we had a patch of wild peppermint left over from hundreds of years ago. Mm. And uh, she said, I'd like to go out there with my dollies and set them all up like a hospital ward. And I made uh, uh, peppermint pills with mud. Oh, wow. And into their <laughs> wow. <mouth. Yeah. laughs> so, at the age of four. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those were the early uh, beginning days. And I guess I put plants aside for many years uh, until I went to live in the hills of Mexico during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. My boyfriend at the time was a draft resistor and we left America in uh, 1970 and went to Guerrero, Mexico and the uh, Nahuatl people of that part of Mexico were, we lived in an extremely remote town that was a 18 hour bus ride from the highway and a 14 hour walk wow. Um, wow. through the uh, through the Guerrero mountains, the, um, the Sierra del Sur. Yeah, the Sierra mountains del Sur. And so I lived there uh, with the Nahuatl people for almost 10 years. And because it was just de rigueur, everybody knew plants, everybody knew how to use simple home remedies. Doctors were very far away. I mean, a 14 hour walk, you're not gonna run to the doctor. So uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, become uh, friends and colleagues of some of the, uh, the grandmothers and the aunties and who took me under their wing and um, taught me medicinal plants of uh, my new, uh, new environment. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. And then, of course, I met Don Alicio. Right. In uh, 1982, I left Mexico, came to Belize as a doctor of nephropathy. I'd already gotten my degree at the Chicago National College of Nephropathy and uh, met my husband, Dr. Greg. And together we came to Belize. We bought 32 acres of uncleared jungle like high bush, as they say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on a beautiful uh, tropical river known as the Macal River in Western Belize. And uh, here we have been ever since 1982 on this little piece of tropical homestead, starting with 32 acres. And now we have 16 acres. And so once I met Don Eligio, I was really, uh, I really had to find someone who could teach me about the medicinal plants of Belize. I yeah. already had a clinical practice. I had already been a practicing herbalist in America and Mexico. Now I needed to learn about these uh, lowland plants of the Yucatan Peninsula. So uh, when I met Don Eligio, he uh, was also looking, he came to my clinic unannounced, looking for flor de tilo, which is linden flower in mm. Spanish. Hmm. He loved like linden yeah. flower tea for, um, for sleeplessness at nighttime. Don Eligio was 90 when I met him. He lived to be 103, so I was with him for the full 13 years, the last years of his life. So he came to see me one day. He heard there was an American herbalist in San Ignacio, hmm. and uh, he stopped by to see if I had any linden flower tea to help him sleep at nighttime happens to be one of my favorite healing trees. So I did have linden flower tea and he was very impressed by that. What a connection. Oh, yeah. so I gave him a bag of tea and then he looked at my uh, napropathic treatment table and he said, oh, my neck, ah, oh, my shoulder. So hmm. I said, get on the table, I'll give you a <laughs> treatment. Well, poor guy was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> with herbs and treatments and mm. and I really did not know this was the famous Don Alicio Panti mm -hmm. until afterwards and when I found out his name I said well you know I've been looking for you I really really need someone to teach me about the medicinal plants of Belize is it okay if I come to visit you in your village of San Antonio and he said in Spanish see sí. There I will be, ni mas ni menos. I will be there no, neither more nor less than you see right in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Don Alicio was very funny, very, very funny guy. And so I went the next week and the next week and the next week. And it was a full year of going 
every week for one day to visit him, sit in his clinic, collect firewood, sweep the floor, sweep out the patio, uh, translate for his clients who did not speak Spanish. And sometimes I even gave enemas to the women who came. Mm -hmm. But he just uh, continually said, no, no, I can't teach a gringa. I can't teach a gringa. Till I arrived on his doorstep exactly one year later to the day of the first day that I came to see him in September. And I got there early this time. I got a ride from home. So I arrived at oh, maybe 6.30 a.m. instead of the usual 9 or 10 a.m. And so he was just going off to uh, finish harvesting his corn. And when he opened his wooden door and he saw me standing on his doorstep, the look was quite devastating. Mm. The look said, oh no, she's here again. So I said, this is it, my last day. If he doesn't agree to teach me today, I'm never coming back. Certainly, I did not intend to be a, uh, a bother or an annoyance to this wonderful old Maya healer. So he said, I don't have time for you today. I have to go harvest my corn. And I said, well, can I help you harvest corn? And he said, hm, what do you know about harvesting corn? You're from Chicago. And I said, <laughs> well, Don Alicio, I lived in Mexico for 10 years and... I know how to harvest corn. Let me help you. <laughs> so off we trudged. And it was a 90 minute trudge through the hillsides to get to his milpa. And we had to crawl on our bellies for 20 feet to get into the cornfield because he liked to keep it hidden. Huh. And when we got to the end of that little crawl on your belly non pathway, I looked up. And there was this magnificently beautiful field of corn that you would think five young men had done together. And Don Eligio at the age of 90 had cleared that little piece and planted it and cultivated it. Now he was carrying the corn home to his family, sack by sack on his wow. back. Wow, what vitality. Mm. Yeah, I tell you at 90 years old, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've was throwing the corn cobs in my uh, my um, big uh, my uh, harv corn harvesting basket that you kind of tie around your forehead. And around sometime in the middle of the morning, we met in the middle of a corn row. And he looked at my pile of corn cobs and my basket full of corn cobs. And he said, hmm, are you married? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, Don Eligio, I'm married and I have three children. And he said, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> after all that time, one year of coming to see him, he still yeah. didn't really know very much about me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, at uh, around noon, we're at the top of the hillside and it's time to take a little break. I break out an orange and I share it with him. Then he stood up and he said, ¿Qué es que tú quieres? What is it that you want? Mm. And I said, Don Eligio, I want to learn about the medicinal plants of Belize. And I promise to be a good student. I promise not to be an annoyance. And I promise to be as helpful to you as is possible to be. So he stood up and right behind him and a mountain behind him came up the sun. And so there he stood with this great a great medallion of golden rays of sunlight all around him. And at that moment, he agreed to teach me. And wow. so it was a 13-year uh, apprentice, seven years of uh, being in the bush collecting plants with him and for him, four days and three nights of every week for seven years. After that, I went one, sometimes two days, out of every week to visit and check on him. And then also if he was ailing, if he had a cough or anything was wrong, I would always go there, take care of him and spend, stay in his little hut in a hammock until he was better. So finally, Don Alicio passed away at 103 in 1996. He was born in 1893 in Peten, Guatemala, which is the Guatemalan uh, district right next 
to Belize on the Western border. Hmm. Wow. Sounds like a beautiful reciprocal relationship where you could help steward his last years of life with like grace and ease by taking care of him in such a good way. And then it meant a lot to him because he was a widower and his wife had only died three years before I met him. And he told me one day, he said, I've done a lot in my long life, but the best part of my life was loving a woman. And he said, a a man without a woman is half of nothing. (laughs) (laughs) A mitad de nada. Uh-huh. Nothing. <laughs> That's really. So sad. I was. A, yes, it, it was an honor to uh, to be his companion, uh, to keep him company, take care of him. He was an insomniac who liked to talk until four o'clock in the morning. Oh wow! Wow. And he closed the doors and windows at seven, and into the hammocks we went. He in one room, I in another room, with a little cotton curtain between us. Then he would start to talk, which is how I learned so much about Don Eligio's long life, wow. his many trials, his uh, many triumphs and trials. And uh, how that's how I was able to sit down and write the uh, narrative about him, Sastun, my apprenticeship with the Maya healer, because I had heard every story, I don't know, 200 times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He did. He was at the phase of life where he repeated himself a lot, but that was a treasure. It was wonderful to hear it again and again. So I could sit down and um, type his life story into the computer practically from rote, Mm -hmm. word for word as he gave it to me. Oh, that's amazing. So what is a Sastun? Yeah, Sastun is a Maya word. It's a fascinating word. Sas, S-A-S, means light or mirror, something shining or reflective. Tun is stone or age. So Sastun is light of the ages, mirror of the ages. And so it is a little uh, crystal ball, actually, a little shiny, clear crystal ball that Don Eligio used for divination. He was a, uh, he was a Maya shaman, Himen. I did not know that when I met him. I thought he was a very accomplished and the most famous herbalist in all of Belize. But somehow it escaped me that he was also one of the last living Maya shamans of modern times. So his sastun is the magical instrument that gave him the ability to contact the Maya spirits to, in order to um, divine, to do uh, certain enchantments. One of his um, favorite enchantments was th- with the sastun was to enchant a photograph of a young person who did not study properly in school. Well, grandmothers would bring photographs of their young, of their grandchildren who were in high school or university and lagging in their studies. And Don Eligio would do a little uh, enchantment around the photograph that basically said, now listen to me, you sit down and you study, you listen to me, you sit down and you study over and over again. So, Wow. And so, and also the Sastun could give any answer to any question that could be answered by yes or no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Only that yes or no was always the answer. And uh, he had a little clay jar, which he said was teleported by the Maya spirits, just showed up on his doorstep one day. And the little Sastun was teleported by the Maya spirits as well, showed up in his hammock one day. So putting those two together, he could put the sastun in the clay jar, twirl it around and around with a very specific Maya chant, depending on the request, the question, or what job he was asking the sastun to do. I never learned to read the sastun. I think that I had a block. As I always said, I'm a physician, not a magician, Mm -hmm. but Don Eligio was. Don Eligio was a magician just stepping into that realm of um, divination and incantation, 
just uh, the doors never really opened for me. I learned a great deal about um, medicinal plants. I learned a great deal of Maya prayers. I learned a lot about Maya spiritual healing and I do Maya spiritual healing, which involves herbal baths and prayers and burning copal incense. But the Sastun always remained uh, and still is a mystery to me, although Don Eligio gave me his Sastun before he passed away. Oh, wow. What an honor. There's mm-hmm. definitely. <laughs> yeah. There, there seems to be um, not always, but often a, a correlation between uh, spirituality and, and healing. And, and, you know, oftentimes uh, physicians are magicians. Some oftentimes they aren't, you know, sometimes magicians are also physicians. Sometimes they aren't, but there does still seem to be this uh, connection. Um, and, and to me, it seems like spirituality is very important to healing. Uh, but w- what is your take on that? What is the importance of spirituality for you? Well, if we think about the Maya system, Don Eligio also used that sastun to determine if a person's ailment was caused by physical issues or caused by a spiritual problem in their life. And that spiritual problem would be something like anger, envy, envy and jealousy. Uh, It might be grief. And the Sastun could say, yes, this is a spiritual disease. So, and that was all the information Don Eligio could get. So if we, if he knew a person who had a uh, recent uh, trauma, trauma or PTSD or the word in Spanish is susto, the person had a susto, which is a recent fright, there are thousands of ways to get susto, thousands of ways to be traumatized. Uh, it might be something like having a robbery in your home or being accosted at nighttime somewhere down a lonely lane or uh, a fire in the home, all those types of things that are traumatic, hurricanes, storms. So in that case, then a person has a series of seemingly physiological complaints, but they are not not physical, they are actually of a spiritual or slash emotional nature. So let's just say something like a recent fire in your home in which you lost everything and barely escaped with your life and and were afraid that perhaps the children wouldn't escape. So this is a tremendous traumatic event to a person that um, makes their um, parasympathetic nervous system on super high alert all the time so that the rest, the rest of the systems of the body are not getting the same amount of vital energy that is necessary. So that person has what we call a laundry list of physical ailments. They are never the same, but some very common ones as a result of this, of this um, traumatic event The most common ones would be difficulty with digestion. Just they might say everything I eat upsets my stomach, unable to sleep properly. If uh, someone says, gee, you look you look different. Is everything okay?" They start to cry right away. Um, They just feel completely off center. Mm -hmm. And the treatment would be a series of Maya prayers usually nine prayers specifically for susto or trauma. Then there would be nine herbal baths with plants and water collected with prayer and thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. In order to treat a spiritual ailment, you must have, of course, a spiritual preparation. So the plants have to be addressed properly in the garden or in the field and you ask permission and then we always repeat the prayer of thanksgiving Mm -hmm. that Don Eligio gave me which is in the name of the father and of the mother and of the holy spirit Mm. I give thanks to the spirit of this plant and I have faith with all my heart in your great healing power to help Mary Lou through this time of trauma 
And so we would say that while we are collecting the bath, and then we would get some kopal to burn, I would say the prayers into the person's uh, pulse, three in the right, three in the left, three over the forehead, and then sprinkle and splash the herbal water on them and burn kopal, and then let them put their feet in a bucket of that water. And then usually people are tremendously, tremendously relieved of their emotional burdens. Susto or fright is only one. Grief, of course, is another really big one. If we go back to the same example, if you had a great fire and you lost all of your belongings, you have uh, trauma and grief mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we often treat uh, those two together. So these, um, these situations can really mimic physiological diseases, but they are not. And usually a person who comes, came to Don Eligio or comes to me has been to uh, Merida in Mexico. They've been to Guatemala. They went to the clinic in Belize City. They went to the clinic in Chetumal in Mexico. And as Don Eligio would say, la máquina no muestra. No machine will show it. Mm -hmm. No machine will show it. So it's common knowledge that when uh, you're under stress, your cortisol levels go up and that interferes with all manner of every aspect of physiology in the body. And so that's what's behind my spiritual healing is identifying what, the, how, where did this situation begin? Then we know a person has, has grief, they have fright, they have anger, or they are suffering from envy and jealousy from other people. So yes, we have to look to see that is this really a physical problem or is this a spiritual problem? And uh, I don't use the Sastun to determine that, but I have a series of specific questions. And usually in, in a short interview with three or four questions, I know this is more of a spiritual ailment than a physical ailment even though they've been to five or six clinics and have uh, no diagnosis, no treatment and no help. Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of a red flag there anyway. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked about spiritual baths and one of your books is, is about, is about spiritual bath, spiritual baths, spiritual bathing. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing and it's, it's something that you can see in other cultures too. Like to me, it, it looks a lot like hoodoo practices of spiritual bathing and all, you know, all sorts of other cultures have this sort of practice. Um, so what, yeah, what is spiritual bathing and what do you use it for? Is it mainly for these sorts of spiritual problems like grief and anger and, and these sorts of things, or, or is there a wider application? Yeah, I mean, it can be ap applied in a wider area. There's also um, baths for Thanksgiving and baths for celebration, mm -hmm. baths that might happen uh, pre-ceremony, pre like before a wedding. Uh, you know, if we think about it, baptism is one of the first baths. And then uh, every culture in the world, as you said, has this concept of using water and basically water by itself, but water, plants, and prayer is the, is the Maya system. And the concept is it's not a soaking bath. There's no bathtub involved. We have a chair. I have the bucket that I prepared, and I have a nice uh, gourd bowl that I use, and it is sprinkling it over the person's auric field because the emotional charge that goes with the traumatic event is in the magnetic energy field of the person. It is manifesting in the physical body, but the, the healing is from without. So that's why the bath is done outdoors, if at all possible, sometimes it isn't, can be done in the shower stall as well, but it is more of an energy bath then it is a body bath experience. Um, so they are incredibly um, beneficial and incredibly uh, effective for people 
who have had long standing emotional uh, issues in their lives, some that they cannot even identify. Yeah. It's not even essential that we identify the emotional ailment because the, whatever it is, the treatment is the same. The benefit of identifying the emotional element is that it helps a person to put a name to what they have been plowing through, sometimes for uh, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. But so can certain plants be more helpful for um, certain ailments? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I don't think so. Don Eligio taught me more than 200 plants that could be used for spiritual baths. Mm -hmm. We all have uh, plant allies. My allies are basil, rue, and marigold. So if they're available, that would always be my go-to. Uh, if I'm in the northern areas, the northern climes, I might like love to use rosemary, but it doesn't grow in Belize. So it doesn't depend specifically on the plant that this plant is only good for uh, fright. This one is only good for grief. It doesn't work that way. We have uh, plants that have both physical and spiritual abilities in healing. What matters is that the prayer of thanksgiving and faith mm -hmm. was said to the plant before it is taken from the plant or from the earth and that all plants are approached with respect and dignity. So mm -hmm. Don Eligio taught me to stand in front of the plant for just a few seconds and wait, wait for that energetic connection. And you really do feel it. It's sometimes a rippling in the solar plexus. Sometimes it feels like your heart uh, chakra is pulling, pulling towards the plant. And sometimes it's a very strong, not today, not for me, go away, not me today. <laughs> doesn't mean that the plant won't help. The plant can't help today for any number of a hundred um, reasons. Maybe it's been too dry. Maybe it just doesn't, doesn't want to give up any more leaves before it flowers. So we stand in front of the plant, say the prayer, take that moment to tune in and say that prayer of faith and thanksgiving while collecting the plant. And then the prayer of faith and thanksgiving is also said to the spirit of water. So with all this together, we know if you ever uh, read Masuro Imoto's books, the, the messages from water, he has some uh, fabulous um, photographs of water that was prayed to before photographs of water taken right out of um, Lake uh, in, uh, in the middle of Tokyo. And then that same water was photographed, froze, frozen and photographed, put under a microscope and it looks like a murky pond. That same water he held in his hands and prayed with, prayed with, and then froze it and photographed it and it turned into a snowflake. So when we say those prayers into a person's pulse, we are actually putting that magnetic charge of love and compassion into the person's physiological being in, the, in all of the, the bloodstream, all of the lymphatic channels. And um, so I just imagine that our bloodstream and our lymph tissues and lymph uh, fluids turn into crystalline formations. Mm. And it's tremendously helpful to people. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to teach spiritual healing than it is to teach about uh, physical healing with medicinal plants. I uh, have some uh, week-long classes on Maya spiritual healing here in Belize. And the hardest aspect of that is that it is not written in stone. Like your question, are there certain plants that are better for certain spiritual ailments? Overeducated people are very accustomed to having one answer to one question. Mm. We are trained that way by those multiple choice questions from, from, from our educational system. But in uh, spiritual healing, it just doesn't work that way. The biggest factor in spiritual healing is number one, love. 
Mm. You can't do spiritual healing if you don't feel love mm. and in your heart. It's even more important than compassion. So when you stand in love, and I always tell my students, think of what it's like, what does it feel like to be loved? And what does it feel like to love another? If you simply think of that emotion, you are standing in love. Therefore, your own energy field is bright, probably blue or pink, so that it that your auric field mixes with the field of the other of the person that you're trying to help. And just that is such a, a positive healing effect. I know that many other herbalists and healers have heard other people say it's so calming just to be in your presence. Yeah. And the, if the effect of that is just standing in love. Mm -hmm. So we stand in love and we have faith. Very, very important that a person has their own faith and it doesn't matter who that deity is, but you have to have a deity in order to accomplish spiritual healing. You cannot do it alone. That's impossible. Speaking of doing it alone, can you do a spiritual bathing healing on yourself? Or do you kind of always need, um, you know, a healer or a person to help you? No, help I teach people to do it all the time. I have a lot of online clients right now because of the COVID crisis. And I have to teach them to prepare their own um, spiritual baths. And I do my own. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I love the baths. I do them usually once a week, sometimes 10 days, but never does 10 days go by with that, that I haven't done a spiritual bath. When I'm in Belize, of course, I can be outside in January and I have my garden and I live on 16 acres of rainforest. So lots and lots of plants available to me. Mm -hmm. If I'm in the, in the States, I live in an apartment in Chicago when I'm there. I have a small patio. So I often prepare uh, my bath. I always grow basil and marigolds everywhere I go. So I often prepare my bath with basils and marigold. And I might do it in the bathroom. I might do it out on the patio. Just depends. But yes, they can most definitely be done for the self. And they are very calming, very healing on a really, really deep level. And what um, people tell me afterwards is, I don't even remember what I was so upset about. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's how incredibly um, clearing they're just clearing on the emotional, physical, and the spiritual level. And there, my book, uh, spiritual bathing from around the world uh, chronicles how it's, it's used by um, cultures, India to native Americans, Japanese, Chinese, Romans, Greeks, was a fascinating book uh, to research because people all over the world have discovered that water, plants, and prayer is healing. Yeah. So speaking of uh, divinities, um, you have a relationship with Ixchel, is that correct? Is that how you pronounce her name? Yes, Ixchel. Ixchel. Yeah. Well, yeah, reading about her um, on your website was was really interesting. Do you think you could tell our listeners a little bit about her? Sure. Ixchel, that's I-X-C-H-E-L, is the Maya goddess of healing, the goddess of medicine. She's the earth goddess, the moon goddess, the goddess of birth, and the goddess of death. Um, the patron of all medicinal plants. And I first learned uh, her name, uh, collecting plants in the high mountains behind San Antonio village with Don Alicio. We had gone to uh, look for a, a specific root that he needed to have. And we found the biggest one he'd ever found on that mountainside in 50 years of collecting in that same area. And he said, can't believe that this, this cabron this plant has escaped me for 50 years, but it's because it's because when a male, when a man herbalist walks in the mountains with a woman, Ishchel smiles on him and helps him find his medicine. And I said, Oh, who's Ishchel? 
That was the first time I heard her name and he told me she's the goddess of medicine and the goddess of healing for the Maya people. And that started a uh, 40 year love relationship with this goddess whose uh, temple and sanctuary for women was on ancient Cozumel Island. So during a period, the pre-Hispanic period, Cozumel Island was known as Tan Tun. Tan Tun simply means built on stone. It's a very uh, stony outcropping of an island about, I don't know, maybe 30 miles off of um, Playa del Carmen in Mexico and Yucatan. So there women went uh, to deliver their babies. They went to learn midwifery. They went there to learn stargazing, astronomy, astrology, and uh, to become healers, to become herbalists. And it was a pilgrimage site for women in the Maya days, uh, ancient days, pre-Hispanic times. Every woman in the Maya realm had to make a pilgrimage to Ischel's temple at Cozumel Island before she married and then after she completed her reproductive year. So at Menarche and menopause, women made a pilgrimage. The first was to ask for healthy pregnancies, deliveries, healthy babies, the right amount of boys and girls. And then at the end, it was to give thanks. Mm. But this was also um, the sanctuary for women who were in trouble. If they were mistreated at home, any woman could go to Cozumel Island and live there for the rest of her life. Wow. Uh, the women there also um, gathered up orphans and brought them to Cozumel to be raised because the, um, the men, the male priests, not to, not to lay this down at the feet of men in general, but the priest of the war god uh, liked uh, orphans for sacrifice because they were pure. So the women tried to protect the orphans from the male, they were called the heart takers. Wow. To protect the orphans from the heart takers, the women would go, they found out that a woman died in childbirth, they would take the orphan, wrap it up and take it off to Cozumel Island where it would be raised boy or girl. Girl could spend her life there. A boy would be apprenticed to someone on the mainland by the age of 12. So it was a fascinating uh, ancient uh, culture on uh, Cozumel Island and it was uh, run, run by and for women of that time. It was also like a uh, university. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where Ischel was worshipped and adored and her temple was and um, medicinal plants. And that was fascinating. So I wrote two novels about Ischel and Cozumel Island. One is the Oracle of Ischel and the other is the Island of Women. And they're both on uh, Amazon right now. That's so interesting that you wrote some some novels. They were going into the slower winter time here, and I love mm -hmm. novels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So how did how where did that inspiration for actually like writing a novel like or a story? Where did that? Well, come so, you know, being so steeped in the Maya culture as I was for my thirteen years with Don Eligio, and the more I learned about Ishtel, just the more enchanted and fascinated I became. So I just started doing uh, research. I'm sort of a research nerd. I, I love it. So I stuck my nose in uh, historical books for a full 10 years. I went to the Vatican Library to look at the old um, chronicles of the early Spanish friars from the 1500s. I went to libraries in several cities of Mexico, in Madrid, because of the uh, Spanish Conquistadores left a lot of their chronicles at the uh, museum in Madrid. So all over the world, actually the best, <laughs> the best, best was in uh, Portland. The Portland University has a fabulous connection. It's the collection, it's the mother load of books on the ancient Maya at uh, Portland University. So mm -hmm. I uh, have friends there 
And I also taught many classes in Portland. So I was able to say, I'm just going to be here for two weeks in the basement of the library researching. <laughs> Fun. Until 10 years go by. And one day I said to myself, all right, Rosita, you have to put a stop to this. Now sit down and write your book. <laughs> and then, you know, I had um, documents two feet high and many different uh, files in the computer filled up with information. And so, yeah, so I sat down and uh, wrote those two novels and it was a great experience. I really felt like I was transported to the ancient days of the Maya. While I was writing it, these characters became parts, part of my life. Mm. I miss them actually. So every mm. once in a while, I pick up the novels just to go back, back to those ancient days. I tried my best to recreate Maya life in the Yucatan Peninsula between Belize and Mexico as I could, what they ate, what they wore, what mattered to them, what would it have been like to be a woman who uh, worshipped Ischel, one of her priestesses. It's a story about a priestess of Ischel. I can't wait to read them this winter. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I really would love to talk about abdominal massage. And I was wondering if you could tell us what it is and how you learned about how to do it. Sure. Um, during my 13-year apprenticeship with Don Eligio and a 10-year apprenticeship with a, um, a Maya midwife, Miss Hortense Robinson, a herbal midwife, two things impressed me the most. Of course, the spiritual healing was one that I use all the time in my practice and my teaching. And then the other was this concept of the abdominal massage. And that abdominal massage was uh, specific for all manner of digestive complaints, GERD or indigestion or inability to eat a full meal without gas pains or chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, anything to do with the digestive tract, and then also anything to do with the reproductive area of the body for men or for women. So, um, I was just uh, so impressed. Don Alicio had uh, women from all over um, Central America come, come to his clinic to, um, to get this treatment for menstrual pains, for fertility issues, for menopausal issue. And uh, it was uh, primarily about repositioning the uterus in its proper position in the pelvic floor so that it has a complete complement of arterial blood going into it, which is the life force. It's full of oxygen, vitamins, minerals, and hormones, and then also a good flow, outflow of the venous blood and a flow in and a flow out of the lymph. So it's a process of uh, repositioning the uterus in order to allow for a complete unrestricted flow of nerve, artery, vein, lymph, and of course the chi, which in Maya is chulel. So I learned it from Don Eligio and it helped me personally a great deal with my own physical problems at the time. And then I started using it in my practice. My practice was uh, mostly from the uh, Mennonite community here in Belize. And the Mennonite community, uh, women might have as many as um, 18 children. Mm -hmm. Nine children was a small family. So because my practice was mostly women and children, my husband took the boys and the men, I was able to uh, apply these techniques to uh, hundreds of clients over the years and so incredibly impressed of what this simple abdominal massage could do for digestion, reproduction, for the prostate, for constipation. It's really, um, it's quite, quite amazing how many uh, undiagnosed, untreated ailments can be corrected with the Maya abdominal massage. 
Yeah. You just listed some of like the major health problems that people deal with on a daily basis with gastrointestinal problems or exactly uterine very, very common ailments that, that it addresses in a very, um, a very simple, very non-invasive way. Um, so yeah, it's and also, it really does a great deal to relieve emotional stress within. I think we all know that feeling of, uh, tightening up in the stomach muscles, tightening the diaphragm that can cause a backache and a misplaced uterus can cause a backache. It could cause swelling in the legs. So uterus is very likely to, to become out of its proper and central position, especially through falls to the sacrum. Mm. That's the, probably the number one reason uh, pushing too much during uh, childbirth, pushing too hard, too long is another way that the ligaments get overstretched. Mm -hmm. And then they need extra help to get its organ that it's supporting back, uh, back into place uh, properly. And uh, it's uh, quite amazing how many seemingly unrelated ailments it can address, like even headaches, or uh, even some uh, some metabolic problems can be greatly relieved by massaging over the digestive organs. Mm. So, yeah, so it's just literally a physical massage of the digestive organs and reproductive organs in a gentle mm -hmm. way to reposition mm -hmm. the organs in the uterus to be getting the best. Um, yeah. Health. yeah, the female organs have the tendency to become misplaced, if you will, because they are held, the uterus is held up by 14 ligaments. Mm -hmm. So ligaments overstretch and ligaments contract. So mm -hmm. overstretch ligaments, say for instance, from uh, pushing too hard too long can cause a uterus to prolapse after childbirth. It can cause a uterus to fall, um, for, fall uh, forward over the bladder and cause untold number of genital urinary issues. Yeah, so yeah it's an incredibly uh, beneficial, non-invasive technique that basically addresses hemodynamics and homeostasis. Hemodynamics, mm -hmm. unrestricted flow of all the liquids in our body. And of course, homeostasis is um, God-given internal balance within. Mm. And so do you teach people how to do this on themselves or others? Yes, I actually invented the self-care for my uh, abdominal massage because uh, doing it on clients, I just thought this, this gal needs to do this every day to get uh -huh. these ligaments back into a uh, proper position. I couldn't see her every day. So I began teaching people to do it for themselves. Cool. Now that I see so many clients online also teach people to do the self-care. And I'm really, really impressed at how, how many improvements we can make. And I never put my hands physically on the person. I just Amazing. taught them to do self-care. But yes, it's a very large component of our training. Everybody who goes through the training has to learn their own self-care and has to learn and demonstrate their ability to teach self-care in their clinical settings, because it is so important, especially to women whose uteri are subject to um, misplacement all the time, mm. especially if it's a woman who has five kids and she just had a baby. Now she has to lift up her two-year-old because he's crying. That's enough, just that, to bend over after you've just had a baby and lift up a two-year-old, that's enough to cause the uh, uterine ligaments to overstretch wow. and lead to a, um, a prolapse. Prolapse comes in four stages. It could just be the cervix drops down a little bit in the vagina. It could be all the way outside. So, yeah. So I, I wonder if that is one of the major reasons why we're seeing so many problems with fertility. Yes, it is one of the reasons. Um, the um, hormone disruptors in uh, insecticides and herbicides, that's yeah. certainly uh, another reason. Um, sure. Ovulation uh, is changing. Uh, male male um, um, 
fertility is changing because they are their um, their sperm is also subject to hormone disruptors like our ovaries are. Mm -hmm. So yes, we very often about 30 percent of women with a fertility challenge come into the clinics of our abdominal therapy practitioners with a fertility issue, 30% will get pregnant after a massage. Oh, and wow. Primarily that's a misplaced uterus or um, um, congestion mm -hmm. of the uterus and swelling. The swelling of, of the uterus, which may be excessive venous fluid that's unable to move, it could be excessive lymphatic fluid that's not able to continue to move because the organ of the uterus weighs four ounces mm -hmm. and it might be sitting right on top of its own uh, lymphatic and venous flow. So it becomes congested. Right. And so that organ, uh, that organ feels, uh, feels really heavy and uh, it's, not, it's not all done externally, non-invasive. Some of our practitioners are midwives, some are nurses. Some people do have the, um, have the uh, scope of practice to do internal exams, but most of our practitioners in the abdominal therapy collective do not, but it's not necessary. We do excellent work uh, externally and especially with self-care. We also use castor oil packs and we use uh, yoni steams hmm. with different herbs. So you can tell physically from the outside if a uterus is tilted or congested. You can, unless it's retroverted. It's too far back if it's retroverted, but then the symptoms don't lie with yeah. the retroverted. Yes, so you, it can be palpated. Um, woman lying on her back. We train people to uh, palpate the uterine position. And if you don't feel anything, it's because it's not out of position. <laughs> not every uterus finds its way out, out of its uh, home spot, mm -hmm. but um, either it's retroverted, we can't feel it or it's okay. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's why the abdominal therapy is so effective. Maybe she's been under a great deal of, of emotional stress and her diaphragm is so tight at the solar plexus that it is restricting proper arterial flow going down below, below the diaphragm and the big artery that goes to the uterus. So if that diaphragm is tight due to emotional tension, fear, anxiety, worry, then the blood supply to the uterus can be um, diminished. And that upper massage right under the rib cage opens that up and lets blood flow properly. So it's kind of like opening the gates of, of all of this um, healing, energetic, and nutrient-rich fluids that flow in and flow out. Mm. Sounds like such important and helpful work. And it is, it is. And then really, and 85% of women in the world suffer from some reproductive disorder, yeah. whether it be uh, menstrual problems or lack of menstruation or menopause problems or fertility challenge or uh, miscarriages. And so it's a, it's a very uh, vital and important uh, part of healing work to address what women need. Yeah. 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 So how, how can our listeners learn how to do this and um, learn more about abdominal healing massage? The best thing is to go to our website. It's www.abdominaltherapycollective.com. Abdominal Therapy Collective, all one word, small letters. And you can learn about the, the classes that are now really all over the world. Awesome. This month, we had uh, classes in uh, Greece, in Slovenia, in England, here in Belize, and in the United States. So, wow. awesome. yes. Yeah. So we're actively seeking practitioners so we can uh, spread this wonderful healing work more and more around the world to help as many women as possible. Wonderful. Yeah, this, that's really interesting. Um, so we are nearing the end of our time with you. Um, 
people can go to your website uh, to find out about your books and your classes and everything. Uh, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, but is, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners before we wrap it up? Well, I would just like to um, give a word of advice to a um, young herbalist, those who are just getting started. Uh, you may yeah. not be young in years, but you might be young to the profession. Yeah. <clears throat> Find two or three plants that are near you, that grow near your home, even if it's a plant from the sidewalk or if it's a tree down the street, learn their names and really focus and study everything you can find out about them, how they heal physically, if they heal spiritually, what are the components that they are made up of, and uh, use those plants all four seasons. And at the end of the year, if you really know three plants well, I think people would be really amazed at how that that body of information, that knowledge applies way down the line for the rest of your life. And next year, find three more plants. I advise against trying to learn everything all at once. It is overwhelming. There are thousands of healing plants and each one is a personality. Every single one is different. There are how many hundreds or thousands of uh, members of the mint family each one offers something different. But if you just settle down on three plants each year, and hopefully it's a plant that's in your backyard, so you can observe it in spring, summer, fall, and winter. Mm -hmm. And then you want to make a tea, make a tincture, maybe make a salve. And so that's my advice to young herbalists. And have some fun with it as well. Plants are uh, wonderful companions, as Don Eligio said, they are my very best friends. Yeah, uh, so I can relate. <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> and I think that's really good advice. Starting yeah. small is just always yeah. you know, a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I also am thinking to your 13 years with Don Eligio too, of, of studying, you know, every week learning new things. That's a, a long and, you know, kind of slow process compared to mm -hmm. so many of the ways that we learn about herbs now, where it's like, okay, you graduated from like a month long herbal program. Like here's yeah. your certificate. congrats. But like, mm -hmm. yeah, like just well, the I also remember Don Eligio never learned to read or write. Mm -hmm. So uh -oh. there was never anything that I, you know, had in my hand. I had to get it into my head and I took notes. And one day he said to me, oh, they sent you to school. I said, <laughs> yeah, they sent me to a lot of school. And he said, you <laughs> never learn. So what do you mean I won't learn? He said that stick oh. and that paper that makes your mind weak. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that's why it took 13 years. I was too educated. <laughs> <laughs> so is that, do, do you agree with that sentiment? Is it really better just to use your mind? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think once you're steeped into the love of books, you just love books. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I could, mean, personally, I just couldn't imagine, you know, living without my references. I, I love what other people have put out there. And I just, I so enjoy putting together sentences. I'm a writer as well. Mm -hmm. So but I think that there are you know, people still living in parts of the world who have no formal school education, but are brilliant healers and brilliant teachers. So yeah. definitely, I don't think it's a prerequisite for being a healer or being a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Rosita, this has been amazing and I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I enjoyed it very, very much. Oh, good. And uh, cheerio to everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks again. Bye.